the man known in the West as Genghis Khan, more accurately, Chinggis Khan, was born to humble beginnings in mid-12th century Mongolia. Though under him and his successors, most of Asia would come to dread the sound of the hooves of Mongol horses, and many millions would die in the pursuit of Chinggisid world hegemony. Such a great and terrible destiny was in no way apparent for most of his life. Here, we will provide an overview of Chinggis Khan's unification of the Mongols. Chinggis Khan was born as Temujin, son of Esugai in Hulun, around 1162. The Mongolia he was born into was a fragmented one. In the 10th to 11th centuries, much of Mongolia and North China was under the rule of the Khitans and their Lao dynasty, a semi-nomadic people who spoke a language close to Mongol. The Lao collapsed under the onslaught of the Jurchin in the early 1100s. The ancestors of the Manchu who declared the Jin Dynasty in 1115. Many Kitans fled west to form the Karakatai Empire in the 1130s, leaving a power vacuum in Mongolia. There, the Mongols formed their own political union, known as the Hamak Mongol. This tenuous military alliance was led by members of the Burzigan and Taichut Mongols, two closely related clans. Though harnessing the great military potential of the Mongol horse archers, they failed to bring all the steppe tribes north of China under their rule. One Khan, Ambakai, was betrayed by the Tartars of eastern Mongolia and handed over to the Jin, who nailed him to a wooden donkey, an insult the Mongols did not forget but were unable to avenge. The Jin dynasty at the height of its power was the single greatest military in the world in the 12th century and in cooperation with the Tartars, would overcome the Hamak Mongol, dissolving it in the 1150s. The clans and families went their separate ways, following whichever warlord could provide victories, though the Hamak lineage still brought respect. One such warlord was Yesuge, a nephew of the final Hamak Khan, but himself only a middling figure, capable of raiding and drinking. In one such raid against the Merkut tribe, he stole America's wife, Ulun, for himself, an attack which would have grave consequences later on. Soon Ulun was pregnant. When Yisugai returned from a raid against the Tartar, she gave birth to a boy clutching a blood clot in his fist, a sign of future greatness. Yesugai named the boy after the Tartar he had just captured, Temujin, meaning blacksmith, denoting strength and iron. Temujin and his brothers Khazar, Khashiun, Temura, sister Temulin, and half brothers Bechtea and Belgutai were raised as every Mongol was. Before they could walk, they were tied to the saddle, learning how to ride and herd livestock sheep, goat, oxen, camel, and horses, which provided all the necessities to survive the harsh winters of the steppes. Pastoral nomadism is not aimless wandering but careful movement between seasonal pastures to prevent overgrazing. Each Mongol child knew how to construct and shoot a bow and to hunt with it, each becoming adept archers. The Mongol bow was a powerful weapon, its recurve design and layers of bone, sinew, and horn providing it tremendous energy. Each Mongol was also instructed in the feuds of their clans, so that they one day may avenge them. Timujin's own name may have been a reminder of the grudge against the Tartars. Most of Temujin's childhood differed little from that of any other Mongol. One of the few unique details coming to us is that he had a fear of dogs. When he was about nine years old, around 1170, his father Esigai took him to choose a wife, intending one from Ulun's Ulkunud tribe, but stopped in the camp of Daisyechen of the Ongrad. Based on a dream, of the ascension of Yesugai's clan, Dai Sechen offered his daughter as Temujin's wife, a slightly older girl named Borte. Yesugai agreed, and left Temujin with the bride's family and made his way home. On the way, Yesugai stopped in a camp, perhaps unknowingly, of the Tartars. Traditionally, guest rites on the steppe were strictly observed, but on this occasion, the Tartars recognized Yesugai and poisoned him. 
The Esagai lived long enough to return to his family. But by the time Timujin had hurried back, Yisugai was dead. This was the beginning of the great upheaval of Temujin's life. Contrary to some modern retellings, Hulun and her children were not immediately abandoned. At the next tribal meeting, the Hurutai, the Tetrio excluded Hulun from official ceremonies. Neither Yisugai's two oldest children, Temujin and Bekter, was old enough to inherit Yisugai's position or followers. Essentially, they were extra mouths to feed, providing little in return. As the Hurultai broke up, Yisugai's followers abandoned Olun, taking their herds, possessions, and leaving her and Yisugai's other wife, Sukhagel, with nothing but their children and perhaps a few select followers. Almost certainly, they would not have been expected to survive the winter. The fact that the future Tringus Han did not die of exposure as a young child is due entirely to the determination of his mother, Olun. With a will as strong as the mountains, she protected her family, scavenging, collecting roots and mice, fishing, whatever was necessary to provide sustenance. It was meager, but enough. Yet, Temujin and his half-brother Rechter were soon at odds. The stress of their situation, the limited resources, and the fact that Vector could legally inherit Olun as his own wife pushed them to the edge. Once Vector began stealing food from the others to feed himself, Temujin acted. With his younger brother Hazar, the best archer among them, they murdered Vector. Olun was furious that they chose to fight amongst themselves, and news must have spread of the murder as the Tatriad came looking for Timujin, capturing him. Placed in a wooden gang, he was held prisoner, a humiliation to demonstrate the ascendancy of the Tetrid over the Borjigan, punishment for Bekter's murder. Not all of Yesugai's former followers were comfortable with this, and the family of Zorkan Shira showed Timujin mercy, finally helping him escape, providing food, a horse, and a bow. The Tetrid Temujin's blood relations had shown him nothing but cruelty. But Temujin found compassion and loyalty among the common herders. Soon reunited with his family, Temujin again found himself aided by those outside the lineage. When thieves stole from their small horse herd, Temujin was aided by a boy of similar age, Borochu, who became his first follower. Around this time, he met an older boy named Jamucha with whom he became blood brothers, Anda. Towards the end of the 1170s, he returned to Daizetium and was finally able to take Borte as his wife. Borte's family gave a black sable coat for Ulun, which Temujin took as a gift to introduce himself to Toguru, Khan of the Heriyet, a powerful tribe who had been Anda with Temujin's father. Toguru loved the coat and accepted Temujin as a follower. With the protection of an overlord, more people joining him, and finally with his wife, Temujin's life seemed to be getting back on track. But soon word spread of Temujin's marriage, and the market attacked them, led by Toktwapeki, the brother of the man who Yesigai had stolen Olun from. Temujin and his band fled, and in the confusion Borte, Suchikel, and their servants were captured. Temujin was distraught, and not for the first or last time, he had seemingly lost everything. After finding guidance on the holy mountain Burhat Khaldun, he turned to Toguru for aid, who agreed, anticipating his share of the plunder. Toguru also reintroduced Temujin to Jamuka of the Jejerad, now a war chief under Toguru. Together, Toguru, Jamuka, and Temujin marched against the market several months after the initial raid. The market broke and fled, and Borte was found safe, but pregnant, or had already given birth. It was forever unclear if the father was Temujin or Amerikat. The boy was named Juchi, meaning guest, and his uncertain paternity hung like a cloud over him. For a brief time, though, life was good. Temujin and his rescued life stayed in Jamuka's camp for protection. For Temujin to learn warfare under Jamuka, and to spend time with his friend. 
During this time, they retook their Onda vows and exchanged golden belts taken from the market. But nothing is permanent on the step. After a year and a half, Borte encouraged Temujin to take his retinue on their own again, concerned the Jambucha would tire of Temujin and abandon them, perhaps taking their followers with him. Ultimately, Temujin left Jamukha's camp, but was surprised to find some of Jamukha's men and their families had chosen to follow him, allegedly on account of a vision of Temujin's future greatness. Though, we might wonder if Temujin hadn't been encouraging their defections all along. Among these defectors were the closest living relatives of the Hamank Khans, an important boost for Temujin's own legitimacy. Around 1184, this assembly appointed Temujin as Khan of the Bojigan Mongols. Jamuha may have been perturbed by Temujin's election and at the split, which he saw as encouraged by those Hamak nobles Altan, Dartai, and Koshar. When Jamuha's younger brother Techar was killed by one of Temujin's herders while stealing horses, Jamuha saw this as an act of war. Jamuka mobilized the 13 tribes at his disposal and marched against Temujin. By now, Temujin had a small army, but not as much military experience as Jamuka, and was certainly outnumbered. At an area called Dalan Baljut, around 1186 or 87, Temujin's army was crushed and he was forced to flee. Jamuka, to terrorize his foes, Boiled some of the prisoners alive in cauldrons and tied a prince's severed head to the tail of a horse. A grave offense which antagonized many, encouraging a number of desertions from Jamuka's force. Nonetheless, Temujin was soundly defeated. The next ten years of Temujin's life are a mystery. The main source, the secret history of the Mongols, cuts from here to 1196. Perhaps Temujin just spent the years in between slowly rebuilding his strength, running from his enemies. But there is some implication he in fact sought refuge within the Qin Empire to the south. A not uncommon act for a steppe leader, but inglorious for the history of the great conqueror. When Temujin was back on the scene in 1196, it was working alongside a Jin army in Togru against the Jin's former allies, the Tartars. While the Jin, Heriot, Mongol army defeated the Tartars, and Temujin and Togru were both granted military titles. Togru was granted the title of Wong, Prince, which became a Mongolian Ong, hence the Ong Han he is often known by. This victory increased Temujin's reputation on the steppe, and provided him loot to get back into politics which brought on more defections to him. The defeat and absorption of a tribe who had raided his camp during the Tartar campaign, the Zhurkhen, also increased his numbers, while assisting Toguru in regaining his own throne. Toguru and Temujin set about raiding and expanding their power. In 1197, they attacked the Merkid in a devastating raid, after which Temujin gave most of the loot to Toguru. Though when Toguru attacked the Merkit the following year, he did so without informing Temujin or providing him anything in recompense. By 1199, they were strong enough to attack the Naiman in the west, formerly the most centralized power in the steppe. The death of the Naiman Han and the vision of his realm between his soon antagonistic sons, Taiyang and Boyuruk, weakened the Naiman considerably. Though the raid was a success, there were efforts by some among the Heriot to break apart Temujin and Toguru. Though it failed as Temujin's forces rescued Toguru's son, Sengung Ilka from a Naiman army, the descent did not disappear. Temujin's organizational structure did not endear him to the old nobility. For many of Temujin's Nukherd, his generals, came from common herders outside the noble bloodlines raised to top positions. The disregard for the old lines was not total, but it was enough, especially when it accompanied the steady rise of Temujin in Togur's coalition. Their enemies outside sought to unite, and in 1201 they elected a charismatic figure to lead them against Temujin, none other than Jamuka. Naiman under Boyuruk, 
market under Toktoabeki, Tartars, Tatriot, and various other subgroupings and vassal tribes made this force. The large, discipline and command were poor, and Jamukha almost seems to have been indifferent to the coalition's success. In 1201, the armies met at Hoyaten in eastern Mongolia. Temujin and Tokul's more cohesive force won the day, and the enemy coalition splintered, various tribes fleeing their own ways. Ramukha, to offset his own losses, pillaged the camp of his own allies. Togru was sent in pursuit of Jamukha, while Temujin went after the hated Tatshield. He caught them on Yoram River, and there avenged himself. Even though he took a grievous wound to the neck, he destroyed them as a political entity and absorbed the remainder into his people, in addition to accepting the submission of Tatshield vassals like the Suldus. A young warrior renamed Tsev entered Temujin's service in the aftermath, having made a good impression despite shooting Temujin's horse with an arrow. Zev would soon rise to become Temujin's star general. The next year, Temujin returned to the Tartars, now to avenge his father. He gave strict orders not to loot until the enemy was totally defeated, to prevent them having a chance to escape. The plan worked, and the Tartars were defeated, rounded up, and executed. The women and children then spread among his people. Temujin's orders meant army discipline held, not broken by individuals running off to plunder, and made it so Temujin could distribute loot evenly and ensure families who had lost warriors still received something, helping strengthen both the Han's authority and loyalty to him. When three of Temujin's relatives, Altan, Kuchar, and Daritai, had started looting early as they felt their rights as nobles, he confiscated and distributed what they had taken, causing them to desert to Tokuro. By now, Tokuro was aging, perhaps in his 70s, and not as decisive as he had once been. Many were wondering who would succeed him. With Temujin now dominating eastern Mongolia and closely allied to Tokuro, he seemed a logical choice, and indeed did suggest that Ong Han's daughter should marry Juchi. This greatly alarmed Tokuro's son, Senglung Eicha, who desired the Khanate, and found common cause with aristocrats in Tokuro's service, such as the newly arrived and very angry Atan Kocha and Dartai. Unable to fight off these whispers, and always concerned over losing his throne, Tokuro planned a trap for Temujin, agreeing to the wedding to draw him in unarmed. But a pair of sympathetic herders learned of the scheme and alerted Temujin while he was en route. Frustrated by this failure, Togru combined forces with Jamukha and attacked Temujin at Halhajit Sanz in 1203. Despite valiant efforts, Temujin was defeated and forced to retreat. They failed to finish off Temujin, however, possibly stopping to pillage his camp rather than pursue, allowing Temujin and the survivors to withdraw to Lake Baljuna in eastern Mongolia. Once more, Temujin had lost everything he had accomplished in the last 40 years, but he was not alone. Drinking the muddy waters of Baljuna, his followers swore oaths of loyalty to him. Those who held firm beside their Khan at Baljuna were known as the Baljuntu, and would remain in great honor under Chinggis Khan. Sympathetic groups came to provide sheep and aid to Temujin at Baljuna, including the father of a young man named Subide. With his forces still trickling in, Temujin had renewed vigor. Defections from the enemy revealed how fragile the anti-Temujin forces were, and Temujin sent messages to the lead figures, reminding them of past promises and loyalties sowing dissent and intrigue. As the coalition fractured, Temujin marched and under cover of night, fell upon the Heriot during a feast. After three days of fighting, they surrendered. Tokuro and Senglin fleeing during the chaos. As he had with the Tartars, Temujin incorporated the survivors, strengthening his force and rewarding both friend and foe who had shown courage in the battle. Old Tokuro fled to the Naiman, but a Naiman patrolman killed him, refusing to believe that pitiful wretch was the mighty Ong Han.
by 1204, Mongolia was divided in two. Central and Eastern Mongolia under the control of Temujin, while in the West, the Naiman under Taiyang Han became a beacon for all those resenting Temujin. Zhamukha talked to Abeki of the market and his sons. This affected elements of the Harriet and more flocked to Taiyang's banner. Taiyang encouraged the Ongun on Temujin's southern border to attack him, but they informed Temujin of the Naiman's plans. Alerted, he set out unexpectedly early in the year while the horses were still thin from winter. When they were in Naiman territory and had been seen by Naiman patrols, at night every soldier lit multiple fires, making it appear the army was much larger than it was, and Temujin knew the panicked Naiman scouts would hurry back to Taiyang with grossly inflated numbers. Taiyang did frighten at the news of the supposed massive invasion, but his wife Gerbisu, son Huchluk, and top commanders accused him of cowardice. His honor challenged, Taiyang was forced to advance, and Nahu Cliff, the armies met, the great final battle for Mongolia. At the battle's opening, Shamukha is said to have frightened Taiyang with stories of the ferocities of Temujin's warriors before abandoning him. Before long, Taiyang and his army were surrounded on the mountain. During the night, many tried to flee, only to tumble off the mountainside in the darkness. Whoever still resisted in the morning was killed by Mongol troops. Few, like Taiyang's son Huchluk, managed to escape. Taiyang himself was killed, and the remainder of the Naiman people were absorbed. 1204 and 1205 were spent hunting those few in the region who still held out. By 1205, the Merkut and remaining Naiman were pushed west of the Altai. Puyuruk was killed in 1206, and a final stand in 1208 on the Irdish River resulted in the death of Toktobeki, flight of his son Kotu to the Kipchak Kangli in the west, and flight of Huchlug to the Karakatai, where he usurped power in 1211. Jamukha himself, after some time on the run, with his comrades continuously deserting him, was finally betrayed by his final five followers and brought before Temujin. For betraying their master, Temujin had them executed, and in an emotional scene in the secret history, urged Jamukha to rejoin him as a companion. But Jamukha urged him to give him a bloodless, honorable death. Otherwise, if kept around, he would only continue to cause trouble, a louse in his collar, a thorn in his coat. In the secret history of the Mongols, Temujin acquiesces and reluctantly orders the execution of his friend. In popular tradition, Temujin buried him with the golden belt Jamukha had given him. In the work of Persian historian Rashid al-Din, writing a century after the events in the Ilkhanite, Jamukha is slowly cut to pieces by one of Temujin's noyans. By 1206, Temujin was the undisputed ruler of the people north of China. That year, at the Hurultai on the Onan River, hoisting the white standard with nine tails, Temujin was proclaimed Khan of all the people in the felt tents, taking a new title, Chinggis Khan. With his rule secured, he reorganized the entirety of Mongol society, rearranged the tribes into new decimal units, removed the vestiges of power of the old Khans, and broke tribal ties, placing the great Khan at the head. With new laws, the Asakh, he standardized and reordered them, provided a clear code of conduct to reduce infighting and appease the spirits. They were drilled in new military techniques, prizing discipline and strong command over all else. The victory of Chinggis Khan was not due to a single factor, but a lifetime of trial and error. His ability to learn from his own failures and defeats, and the inability of his foes to do so, allowed him to finally succeed. He was not born great, nor was it thrust upon him. He had to seize it for himself. But Chinggis Khan knew he would need loot and a common enemy to keep his new union together, and for that, he turned to the south to the kingdoms of northern China.